Thank you, Gary, for the welcome, and uh, my, my welcome as well to all of you this morning. It may be at morn when a day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight, it may perchance be that the blackness of midnight will burst into light in the blaze of his glory when Jesus receives his own. O oh joy, O oh delight, that we should go without dying. No sickness, no sadness, no dread, no crying. Caught up through the clouds with our Lord into glory when Jesus receives his own. O oh Lord Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shout the glad song. Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. So I need not have to tell you what my few thoughts are going to be based upon this morning, need I? The beautiful words of this hymn have already said it all. Prelude to eternal life, Jesus' second advent. Thanks, Mike. That's a bit pale, but um, hopefully this depiction could be our next new frontal mural if the church decides as such. Thanks, Mike. The most wonderful event of the ages was undoubtedly the first advent of Jesus Christ to show us the true character of his Father, the great God of the heavens and the universe. The second advent soon to break upon this planet will be the most stupendous event of all time. Spectacular? No, friends. The word 10,000 times over could never describe what is portrayed in the scriptures, your Bible and mine, i.e. Jesus' entry through the clouds of glory, a trumpet sounding with a deafening blast that causes tombs to crack open to release those whom Jesus Christ has returned to redeem and take home to heaven with him. The trumpet blast, the myriads of the angelic host, poised in the atmosphere, radiating the glory of innumerable suns. It's all there for every eye to behold. A centerpiece, though, outshines this great mass of brilliance. The crowned king is seated upon a dazzling throne. The victory anthem takes over from the sounding trumpet with heaven's choir and musicians in magnificent harmony, the likes of such as never before produced by human minds. Something else is happening as well though. Countless numbers of people begin to slowly rise from off the face of the devastated planet Earth to join the elevated heavenly throng still poised in readiness to receive them. The journey to heaven is about to begin. See you again, planet Earth, in a thousand years' time, when you will once more be returned to Edenic perfection. Some will be heard to say as they begin to rise. If I repeat some of this, I'll try to phrase it a bit differently. So I won't apologise for having a few various tries at the magnitude and magnificence of this event we all hopefully plan to be a part of. The promise. I shall return. The legendary pledge enunciated by the five-star general and commander-in-chief of the United States forces in the Pacific region 
during World War II. General Douglas MacArthur and his US and Filipino forces were experiencing a rough time trying to extract the enemy forces from their entrenched positions and were fast losing the battle and contemplating defeat and surrender. The opposing forces had the upper hand and it was now just a matter of time before the inevitable would happen. Surrender was never on the agenda where the US Army was involved, but now it was going to become a reality. The general conferred with his superiors in the United States and was instructed to personally vacate the region. It would be embarrassing to say the least for the commander in chief to face capture and humiliation by the enemy. Five patrol boats were made ready for the hazardous journey to Australia. It was Ireland hopping at first to clear the main battle area and then it would be open water to reach the northern tip of the mainland of Australia. It would be a rough and dangerous journey. The ocean and enemy aircraft would be of great concern. But before he would obey the order and step aboard one of the PT vessels, he was heard to say in a confident voice, I shall return. But it took him two years to redeem his pledge and considerable fighting and loss of life before he could safely hand back the islands to their rightful owners. I shall return. The statement rings a certain bell, doesn't it? Especially for those in the world today who have faith in the return of Jesus Christ to redeem and to liberate all who have chosen him as their Lord, Saviour and coming King. I will come again and receive you unto myself. Jesus had experienced and gone through the dark waters of death but risen again to life. Yes, he would proceed to heaven in the meantime, but the promise to return would be emphatic, sure, and ultimately faithful. And friends, he will return sometime soon. It's been the positive element of Seventh-day Adventist Church teachings over the past many years. So let's remind ourselves again today concerning this stupendous event that today's conditions in the world suggest is right upon our doorstep. I've tried to tie in a few aspects that either lead up to or touch on the actual event of the ages, the return of Jesus Christ. Of recent times I have shared with you some thoughts I thought were relevant and worthy of consideration with regard to the end times in which we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians believe we now live. And I'm sure I'm not alone in the belief that we are now truly experiencing and becoming aware of many situations on the world scene that suggest the fast fulfilling of all the signs that God's word predicted would be the harbingers of Jesus' return to our planet. And the reason? To redeem and to save that which was lost by way of sin's entry at the time of the newly created human race. My first subject was based on God's prize to be made available to all who faithfully completed their race, their own individual race, not being contested with others who were likewise striving to reach their goal, or the tape that would also guarantee them entry to everlasting life. The Apostle Paul was God's man who likened the Christian's spiritual journey to that of an athlete and his associated training schedule that would give him success and a prize at the end. And that prize at the end, of course, is eternal life, which was the second subject I shared with you in August of last year. 
eternal life. Those two fantastic words was the theme of that message. And it was a joy to do some work on our hereafter. So let's say that God's initial gift to humanity was Jesus Christ. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, we read in his word. However, there is another great truth or promise that completes the end time trio of God's program of reinstatement, namely the event. The occasion of Jesus' second advent to our planet to reward prize winners from all ages with eternal life. Now there's one thing I humbly admit, which is that I am not sufficiently qualified to even scratch the surface of an event that will be the most spectacular, powerful and awesome this world will ever witness. As many term it, the end of the world as we know it today. However, I'm keen to give it a go, seeing I'm a realist. As a former Wangarei pastor once labelled me, and I think all Seventh-day Adventist Christians should be realists with regard to what our God has planned for our actual future. The first Advent was couched in obscurity. Jesus all but silent entry into our planet. No bells ringing for his arrival, excepting maybe some that were attached to the animals that shared the place of his birth. But in stark contrast, his next appearance will be so vastly different. His first mission was to free and save souls for his pending heavenly kingdom. His second, as an enthroned king, to lift his faithful sons and daughters off the face of this planet and transport them to heaven. The event. It is part way through August 09 as I ponder these few following thoughts. The winterless north it's supposed to be, but the past few months of this 09 winter delivered us some pretty harsh and clement weather, which at times tended to dampen one's spirit to continue living and enjoying life, especially for those advanced in years, and I'm one of them. The cold seemed to have been much more apparent with rain persisting a lot of the time. Also, wind and cold had done their part to let you know in no uncertain terms that it was still late winter, with much of life content to simply continue to shut down and rest for a while. It's a similar pattern for those living on the other side of the globe when they too annually experience their winter season and wrath. The difference being though that their cold break includes much lower temperatures with ice and snow included. However, it hasn't been all that bad. There have been many beautiful sunny days this 09 winter with most evenings and nights around a big open fire a real treat. Of now though, as I stated, it's part way through August and there is a slight hint of a much better season around the corner. The trees and certain shrubs are still resting, but most are preparing to awaken and enjoy another year of life. Much of the animal and bird kingdoms are also preparing to produce brand new life. Some already having begun their new circle of, cycle of regeneration. But how can one include these thoughts in the sermon of the hour? It was one of these beautiful late winter days when I took time to wander around June's lovely garden of flowers with a generous variety of beautiful blooms attracting my attention at every turn. I can never give all of them their correct names, but was instantly aware that most were responding to the Creator's program of new growth 
and beauty of colour and bloom. I experienced a warm feeling as I wandered, gazed and considered God's exquisite handiwork associated with all of his creations. Now beginning to awaken and show to perfection with the arrival of spring upon our doorstep. And as I meandered it, absorbed and appreciated, I began to think that maybe it could be such a similar type feeling for the redeemed when Jesus returns and instantly renews our winter-worn bodies at his arrival and reclothes us in heavenly spring fashions like unto his glorious body that will be the order of the new day as we prepare to embark on our journey to the heavenly city. Now some may be thinking I'm getting a bit carried away with all sorts of conjecture and fantasy but to counter such Shouldn't we, as sons and daughters of the Most High God, be the first to express excitement about this promised springtime reunion with Jesus Christ when he arrives to transport us to the promised land and to the mansions he will have had prepared for us? So doesn't the arrival of Jesus dramatically suggest a springtime-type recreation? A new beginning? Can't we ascribe the words of the Revelation text to denote a new dawning? Behold, I make all things new. And John qualifies the statement, right, for these words are true and faithful. So maybe it's not too fanciful to think along the lines of God's springtime restart program when Jesus ushers in the commencement of eternal life upon his return visit. But let's backtrack a, a little bit to my reference of Jesus' second advent and tying it into the idea of a spiritual springtime occasion and a newness of life associated with it. It's the event which will be the most spectacular in the history of this world that I am alluding to, namely the return of Jesus Christ and all his accompanying array or display of splendour and pomp. And so the, the challenge, how does one even begin to describe the occasion of the second advent? How can our mind's eye even begin to remotely imagine the spectacle that will envelop or consume the atmosphere in such a way that all those living on the planet at the time will have the capability to witness all this heavenly glory. Revelation 1.7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, clouds of brilliance, and every eye shall see him, and they also who pierced him, or were responsible for his death having had a special resurrection which will allow them to witness his kingly return. Sadly for many, it will only be a moment's glimpse as the intense brightness and associated heat will render them to instant ash. As in contrast, the living, the living and resurrected redeemed at that time for them, it will be the most glorious sight to behold. Their newly transformed springtime bodies having been instantly changed. Paul states, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body to enable them to look into this spectacle of intense glory and light, even into its central piece, the core where the figure of just one person, a king upon a throne, outshines the sur surrounding glow of myriads of angels, the heavenly hosts who have joined him for his special journey to earth in time of triumph and joy. 
And all of this activity is actually taking place in the atmosphere above the planet. Astounding. I will come again to receive you unto myself. His promise has been faithfully fulfilled. But the second advent is so vastly different to his first visit. For this one is the true springtime visit of renewal that heralds or ushers in newness of life, actual to all who have worked, dedicated and cleansed their lives in Jesus' spilt blood. In preparation of this, the most longed for event of their lives, so let's indulge a bit further into this awesome event. Of course, there aren't suitable words that can adequately address his Jesus reappearing in the clouds of glory. So I, for one, am sure we do no wrong in stretching our imaginations so as to try and capture a little bit extra with regard to that which lies ahead for God's faithful sons and daughters who have lived in the assurance, expectation and blessed hope of Jesus' return to save them for eternity. So let's return to the scene, the planet which has suffered all manner of massive devastation related to numerous end time events including the seven last plagues. Many of God's saints have survived all that the evil one has subjected them to and have stood fast. Along with those who have burst forth from their graves or who have been reassembled from the ocean depths or numerous other resting places. A mighty trumpet blast from the heavenly company in space has given way to the resurrection of the saints from all these various resting places. For the trumpet shall sound or blast, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, that is, from wherever they have rested, for many, over the millenniums of time. But everything is happening so rapidly. The redeemed from all ages are now presently together and form the largest mass of humanity ever to be assembled at one time. And as they break into songs of joy and feelings of elation, they suddenly feel a mighty surge of power beginning to lift them upward into the heavens to join the celestial company surrounding their enthroned king, king of kings. I'm sure it goes without saying that many joyful reunions will be the order of the day as this now innumerable company begin their journey heavenward to God's eternal city. Indicators. Jesus had given the scribes and Pharisees a good, well-deserved working over, a real dressing down because of their hypocrisy their pride and arrogance and their ungodly attitudes toward their fellow men. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, he kept repeating as he outlined all the areas where they came up short of the character of God that should rightly have been expected of them. All of their failings had been noted and observed by him over the now almost three and one half years of personal ministry. He would not get the chance for much longer to castigate them and show them up for what they really were. In other words, he was truly irate with their outward show of false piety that had hoodwinked the rank and file of the public of the day. So he let them have it in no uncertain terms, but he would afterwards pay the price as such exposure would soon ignite them in anger and fury and fuel a situation that was tailor-made for his death upon Calvary's cross. Soon after this dressing down, we find Jesus seated at one of his favourite spots, 
the Mount of Olives. And as he rested there in contemplation, his disciples gathered around him. It was a private little setting and a very beautiful atmosphere for this very special group. They had by now sensed some sort of unnatural ending to these past three and one half years they had spent with him in personal ministry, teaching, exhortation, example, lessons and love, etc. But as of now, they wanted an answer to something of very great interest to them. Tell us when these things, that is, Jerusalem's destruction and the end of the world shall be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Answer. First of all, don't be deceived by many who will purport to be the true Christ. Wars, yes, plenty of them. Rumours as well. Nations and kingdoms pitted against each other. Famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Now these are only the beginnings of sorrow for all those who are my true followers will suffer affliction and some will lose their lives. Some are going to be offended because of me. Others shall betray and hate one another. False prophets are plenty. Peddling deception will cause many to lose their love of me and return to a lacklustre spiritual experience. So it may be a matter of endurance unto the end of one's life. However, the sign or trigger that gives you the best clue to my second advent is none other than the gospel of my kingdom being preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations. Not necessarily to every individual, but to all nations, kindreds, tongues and peoples as a witness. Then shall the end come. Now as to the nature of my return, well, if you are capable of comprehending the magnitude of such, take note. It's going to be as follows. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, in speed and brilliance, that is, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. However, prior to my arrival to planet Earth, there are going to be signs in the heavens, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then all of Earth's inhabitants will suddenly feel sorrowful, being unprepared as they look skyward and see for themselves the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. But for those who are mine, here's the difference. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven unto the other. Jesus continues with some further lessons regarding his second advent and emphasises watchfulness and readiness and also states another version of this great event. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and carry out his work of separation between the two classes the faithful and the unfaithful, the godly and the ungodly, the just and the unjust, the sheep and the goats, etc. Departure. It was coming up to just on 40 days since Jesus had risen from the dead following his crucifixion. Twice before he had made himself known to his special little group of friends. Right now, he was about to have some further pleasant company with them. However, in the meantime, some of them had felt the urge to go fishing, but after toiling hard all night, they hadn't been successful. They were near to land now, in shallow water, and feeling quite discouraged. 
and as well, very hungry. It was daybreak. This lone person on the shoreline seemed to be attending a small fire. A wisp of smoke was rising from the red embers and something was cooking above these embers. The lone person on the shoreline seemed to have a strange idea after checking to see how they had fared. And he yelled out to them, drop the net on the other side. We all know the conclusion to the story so well, don't we? But there was a fourth and final time he would share with the now 11 of his disciples. The meal of fish on the sh shoreline was a very beautiful occasion and probably designed to benefit Peter the most. This time, shortly afterwards, the eleven were gathered together at Bethany for his departure. The 40 days were now up. He was about to leave planet Earth and these men to join his Father in Heaven to begin preparing the dwelling places he had promised to all who would avail themselves of the benefits he had made available from his costly mission of supreme love. And so we find him having his last chat with these men he loved so much. I don't want you to depart from Jerusalem until you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. John baptised with water. You are going to be baptised in a few days' time with the Holy Ghost. Then you will be effective witnesses of me in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I would like to think that he embraced each one personally and said something appropriate that touched their different makeups, even though such is not recorded. He did, however, bless them. Farewell. A wave, maybe? or a hand signal, and he slowly begins to rise heavenward. There's no noise, just a silent lifting off into the atmosphere. There's a cloud above this figure, and he is soon passing through it and disappearing beyond from their sight. The eleven continue to gaze heavenward their eyes intently fixed on the cloud that had enveloped their best friend. They now knew for certain they would never see him again in an earthly setting. They had their commission, but yet they still continued to look up in disbelief as if their eyes had deceived them, transfixed on this cloud. You men of Galilee, why do you continue to gaze heavenward? The two men in white apparel who had suddenly appeared asked them. Your Jesus friend has returned to heaven from whence he had come. When he returns again at the end of time, it will be a similar type setting. Clouds? Yes, friends. But next time clouds of glory and surrounded by all of heaven's angels in spectacular brilliance. And there will not be just 11 persons on this occasion to witness his return visit. No, the gospel writings record, every eye shall see him. His return visit, the blessed assurance, will be the consummation of the plan of salvation and the rewarding of God's various gifts associated with all of his faithful promises. The scriptures tell us this mortal, this present life, which is subject to death, shall put on immortality upon Jesus' second advent when we are changed in an instant and made ready for the commencement of eternal life. However, I read where mankind is striving to upstage God's premier event that includes his wondrous program of perfecting the renewal of our physical bodies. 
I refer to a recent New Zealand Herald article which, with the bold heading, Immortality Just 20 Years Away, claims a US scientist. He mentions new technologies and understanding of genes and computer technology being accelerated at an incredible rate. The process touches on nanotechnologies capable of replacing many of our vital organs within the next two decades. This scientist predicts that they will soon have the means to reprogram our bodies so as to halt and then reverse aging. Then nanotechnology will let us live forever, he goes on to state. Ultimately, nanobots will replace blood cells and they work more effectively. The Olympic sprint will be, ma will be maintained over the duration of 15 minutes without taking a breath and scuba diving for four hours without oxygen. And those who have heart problems will calmly drive to a doctor for a minor operation as their blood bots keep them alive. Finally, if we go into virtual reality mode, nanobots will shut down brain signals and take us wherever we want to go. He concludes by saying we can look forward to a world where humans become cyborgs with artificial limbs and organs. Of course, he doesn't mention costs. And at 20 years hence, I for one won't be around, nor have the funds to have the full kit reconditioning job done. Instead, I would rather place my assurance on what my maker has promised for me when he cracks open the soil one day that covers my remains and brings me forth a brand new being fit for his heavenly kingdom, thanks to Jesus Christ. One big final question. How are we each one going to fare when that great and terrible day of the Lord comes? The second advent. When the heavens shall depart like a scroll and every mountain and island are shunted off their foundations. The famous hymn also asks the same question of all Christians. How shall we stand in that great day? Wanting? Hopefully not. Or with our sins all washed away? An urgent business. Yes, because God's word reads, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night when the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the element shall melt with fervent heat. The earth and its works shall be burned up. As the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Lord be. That stupendous event when Jesus breaks through the cloud formation of glory and calls us up to join him and the angelic host poised in the atmosphere, in readiness for our terrestrial journey through space and on to our new homeland in heaven. So hold fast until that day is my prayer for each one of you because there is nothing more certain in this world than Jesus' second advent to redeem and to save those who are his. But when, Lord is our inquiry. Answer, at an hour when you think not, it may be at morn, when the day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight, it may perchance be that the blackness of midnight will burst into light 
the blaze of his glory when Jesus receives his own. O oh, joy, O oh, delight, should we go without dying, no sickness, no sadness, no dread, no crying, caught up through the clouds with our Lord into glory when Jesus receives his own. O oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. And Jesus' answer for 2010 could be, not much longer, my people, hold fast. That's it, friends. We've got a final hymn, face to face, in all his glory, where we shall see him by and by. Thanks, Claire and Miriam and Katie.